Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous supporters. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash donate. You're listening to Episode 9 of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries both supernatural and natural, anything that's strange, odd, and makes you wonder, the claims and counterclaims from the perspectives of both faith and reason, and in this episode we're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hi, I'm Dom Bethanelli, and joining me today, is, of course, is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So before we get started, folks, I just want to uh, remind you to like... Uh, Mysterious World uh, on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. Retweet us on Twitter when we post the the, the, the episodes there, if you can. Leave us comments. Uh, subscribe to us in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, uh, your favorite podcast app, or on YouTube. We're in all those places. Uh, hit the bell on YouTube to make sure you get notifications, if that's your choice. And share the podcast with your friends to help us grow our community around this podcast and to help us reach a, a larger audience of listeners uh, because we we've heard from you guys how much you've you've we're really enjoying this ep- this this podcast, and we know that m- many more people would enjoy it as well. So uh, spread the news and and let's get the uh, the the news out there about this new podcast. Uh, and we've got a lot of great episodes coming up. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, today's episode is about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, some people may not know about them, Jimmy. What are what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of scrolls, as you would expect, that were found near the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is a very salty lake in uh, in Israel slash Palestine. It's the lowest point on Earth, and so it gets a lot of runoff from other uh, water sources, and that's why it's so salty. It has no outlet. It is so salty that you can float in it without even swimming. Your body will just float and you'll see pictures of people like floating there, reading a newspaper, not even trying to swim. (laughs) Um, It's also so salty that uh, if you have even the slightest nick on your body, it will sting like crazy. (laughs) Um, We have something like the Dead Sea here in America, in Southern California, near where I am. I'm in San Diego County, and one county over is Imperial County, where they have the Salton Sea. And the Salton Sea is the lowest point in North America, and it also is an extremely saline body of water. Um, However, you wouldn't want to go floating in it these days. Back in the 50s, there was an effort to turn it into a resort, but subsequently it's gone downhill, and it's got a horrendous algae bloom, and Stinks like crazy, but uh, it's kind of an equivalent of the Dead Sea. Uh, in any event, the uh, at the actual Dead Sea in um, in Holy Land, there it's a very mountainous area, and there are these caves around it. And back, uh, it's a little ambiguous because um, Bedouin aren't really good with dates uh, or weren't at this time. But back around 1947, there were a couple of young Bedouin shepherds who were tending their flock, and one of them, according to the story, uh, thought one of his flock had gotten lost in a cave, and so he threw a rock into the cave to try to scare the sheep back out. And instead of scaring the sheep back out, he heard pottery breaking. And so he investigated and found these pottery jars that were stuffed full of scrolls. And uh, he recognized it as, you know, potentially valuable antiquities. And so uh, the Bedouin then ended up taking them to uh, the Jerusalem area to sell them on the antiquities market. That led to a lot of scholarly interest. They subsequently found 11 caves, and it's actually now 12, uh, that are known to have held scrolls. And it was the largest and most important literary archaeological find of the 20th century. And uh, I want to come back to uh, how they they ended up where they are now in the hands of uh, of the Israeli Antiquities Authority uh, in a second. But uh, more about the scrolls themselves, what languages yeah. are they written in? 
Uh, they're written in uh, mostly in Hebrew. There are some in Aramaic. There are a few in Greek and even a few in Nabataean. Nab the Nabataeans were another kind of desert dwelling people uh, in that area. And so there are a few in Nabataean. Um, and they, uh, so those are the languages, mostly uh, Hebrew, some Aramaic and Greek. And we'll get into how old they are in a second. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, so I have actually a, a, a glancing connection with the scrolls, but I can talk about that in a second. Uh -huh. But but Jimmy, what, what's 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 your experience with the scrolls? Well, a number of years ago, there was a an exhibit of the Dead Sea Scrolls that was on display here in San Diego, and, and I went to the museum where it was uh, happening, and it was very interesting to actually see the scrolls. I'd known about them you know, for a long time, but I'd never physically seen them. And I had what's kind of a common experience when you're encountering things from the past. It's, wow, look at how small that is. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, if you like tour a Civil War museum or something and you look at the uniforms people were wearing, it's like these were tiny people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, before the modern diet and everything. And the same thing, I had that same experience here. They had like sandals um, that they had found at the site where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. These were sandals from the first century, and they were tiny, you know, as people with tiny feet. And then the scrolls themselves were tiny, uh, and they were very densely written. One of the things with very small hand printing, one of the reasons for that, of course, was back in the ancient world, every book had to be handwritten, and consequently, the co costs of writing and copying a book were fantastically high. It would cost, you know, thousands, the equivalent of thousands of dollars just to make a book like the Gospel of Mark, which is the shortest of all the Gospels. And so these Dead Sea Scrolls are very small. They're very densely written. They don't waste space. They don't have large margins. And it was just another experience of the ancient tininess phenomenon. So I, I actually saw the same exhibit uh, when it was touring uh, and came through Boston here. And uh, yeah, I had the similar experiences. One of the things that struck me about it was um, how the, like you could see they had the, the, the scraps. So many of the scrolls were not intact when they when they were found. And so they had some of the scrap pieces on display. It was very dark, not allowed to take any photography. That was one of the, 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 uh, uh, the rules. rules that they had. Um, in but, a lot of museums. Yeah. Uh, and so I remember that. Well, one of the the one of the, the, the other glancing experience I have is um, when the scrolls were found, they were actually brought to America by mm -hmm. uh, one of the antiquities dealers and yeah. was was kept actually in a basement not far from where I live in Worcester, Massachusetts for many years. Some of them were. Uh, and in fact, um, I used to work at a Christian a church supply and bookstore. Uh, that was very old. Uh, it's gone now, but it was called Whittemore's. And the owner, Carol Whittemore, <clears throat> this guy came in and offered to sell them to him for a few thousand dollars. And mm -hmm. he and he refused. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm not. But he, he was afraid they'd be fake or whatever. He just wasn't interested in it. What am I going to do with them? Um, later on, uh, and I, I don't know if you were going to get into this, but how they ended up back in Israel is, is that the, the, the government of Israel, which was still a very uh, young uh, country at the time, 1948, was you know this was in the fifties by now, um, used cutouts, uh, persons who were stood in for the Israeli mm -hmm. government to buy them from these antiquities deals who were putting ads for them in the in, uh, classified ads in the New York Times and in the papers. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> it, it's I've, I've seen the ads from back then. It's like a little squ small square space ad. It's like. X number of scrolls from the Dead Sea for sale would make excellent present for a religious institution, and <laughs> and they would use go betweens using a not using fake names um, because the sensitivities. You know, there was the 1948 uh, Israeli War where they were basically attacked from all sides right. uh, after their independence was proclaimed, and there was a lot of tension with Palestinians. And so um, to hide the fact that these were being bought by Jews, they used fake names. Right, right. So it's, 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 the, the, the story around them is worthy of a, a, of a Indiana Jones tale. Yeah, uh, we might so, have to do an episode on that sometime. Yeah, just on just the, the, story. the story of the scrolls themselves. Uh, okay, so let's get into the, the content of the scrolls. Um, 
What are the claims that are made about the scrolls, the mysterious claims? Well, um, one of the claims is that they are or were being suppressed by the Vatican, and uh, they were not being allowed into general circulation. Uh, the claim was they contained material that would shake the foundations of the Christian faith, and that's why they were being suppressed. Um, this was coupled with another claim that a lot of people were making that they were written by an early group of Christians, and so they could give us the real story on what Christianity was supposed to be all about before it got off on some other track. Um, they're supposed to contain startling revelations about Jesus and other New Testament figures, including John the Baptist and uh, James the Just. And uh, then there are even there are also claims that Christian scriptures have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm. And and so then the the counterclaims are the, all of that's false. <laughs> that's the counterclaim. None of that is true. OK, so and uh, so what do we know about the, the scrolls? Let's first start with how old are they? What, you know, when were they created? Well, this is something we have a good handle on, partly on paleographic grounds, because we can tell based on the style of writing approximately when something was written. Um, and then in the mid-20th century, we also got a new tool that's been extremely helpful, which is radiocarbon dating where you can tell based on, at least with organic material, like the, what the scrolls are made out of, um, you look at the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14, and it tells you how long it's been since the material ceased to be alive. And so we can use that to date all kinds of different artifacts. In the case of the scrolls, it turns out that radiocarbon dating, as well as paleographic information, indicates that they were written in the 2nd century BC, in the 1st century BC, and a few of them in the 1st century AD. So this is a span of more than 200 years, less than 300 years, um, but it largely predates the founding of Christianity. That 1st and 2nd century BC is when most of the scrolls were written, and therefore they're all before, Christ all those are before the Christian age. And, and that's what one of the things that separates them from the Nag Hammadi library that we talked about before, uh, the lost gospels. They're, these are not right. Christian written in the Christian era. Correct. The Nag Hammadi uh, documents, which were found at Nag Hammadi in yeah. Egypt, um, are date from the Christian age, and they were written by people who professed to be Christians. These documents, however, were not. Um, and and so basically, the, the dating of them alone undermines most of the claims about them, the, most of the exotic claims. And then how do they end up in these caves next to the Dead Sea? The, the Dead sea? Well, there are a couple of theories about that. One of them is that they were um, written on the spot. There's a place, uh, a, a kind of compound uh, that today is called Qumran, and it's right near the caves where, within walking distance of the caves where the scrolls were found. It dates to this time period, um, and it appears to have been the location of the religious sect that used the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, there are some debates, which we'll get into, about exactly who those people were. But basically, they were living here. It was kind of a commune, kind of a first century kibbutz. And, uh, and they had this library of scrolls that they kept in the caves. And then when the Great Jewish Revolt started in AD 66, uh, they realized things were not going well. The Romans were starting to overrun everywhere. They did overrun Qumran. And apparently in, the, in, in that time period, which is like AD 68, um, they uh, rushedly put some of the scrolls into these jars in the caves. It's debated whether the um whether they used them as a library the caves as a library before that and then shoved in the rest of the scrolls or whether they had them all in the compound and then hid them all away in a batch uh but basically they were hidden away during the great jewish revolt that then culminated with the destruction of the temple by the Ro future roman emperor titus in the year 70 okay and what 
what are what's written on the scrolls? What what do they consist of? A lot of them are copies of books of the Old Testament. Uh, we found every book of the protocanonical, which books of the Old Testament. That's the canon that's honored by Protestants and most modern Jews, except the book of Esther. Esther is not found there, and it's unclear whether they whether the sectarians at Qumran accepted Esther as canonical or not. Esther, in its proto-canonical Hebrew edition, is the only book of the Bible that doesn't mention God. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the Greek edition in the Septuagint, the Deuterocanonical edition, has, a, has added segments that do mention God to bring out the theological significance of what's happening in the story. But the proto-canonical edition doesn't have those, and so we know some ancient Jews entertain doubts about should this book that doesn't even mention God be counted as part of the scriptures. Hmm. So we we don't know about whether they thought that book was scriptural, but they they do have all of the rest of the proto-canonical books of the Old Testament. They also have many of the deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament, like uh, Tobit, for example. They have uh, We found copies of that. Um, at uh, Qumran. Uh, in addition to the biblical books, there are also other books that were in common use by Jews of different persuasions, not just this one sect, uh, but other Jews would read these books. They include, uh, for example, Jubilees, which is kind of a rewriting of Genesis. They include First Enoch, um, which is also quoted by the author of Jude in the New Testament. So that's another illustration of how other Jews would read First Enoch. And then there's kind of a third class of documents, which is ones that were specifically used by this group of sectarians, so far as we can tell. They're not used by other Jews as far as we know. Um, an example of that is uh, what's sometimes called the halachic letter, and it's basically a protest against the practices that were being used at the temple. Uh, they at, And apparently is kind of a very early document, one of the founding documents of the sect. They had some disagreements with what was happening at the temple in Jerusalem, and they wrote them a letter to try to persuade it. This document is also sometimes called uh, some works of the Torah or some works of the law, which is interesting from a Christian perspective because it shows that St. Paul's phrase, works of the law, was being used by other Jews in the first century as well. Interesting. That sounds a lot like uh, Catholic uh, social media right now, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> protesting the, uh, what's going on at the temple. And, and there, are, there are some other like unusual scrolls that we'll get into, perhaps they, they get their own uh, episode of Mysterious World, like the Copper Scroll. The Copper Scroll, yeah. There's yeah. one scroll that's not written on organic matter. It's actually a roll of copper, and it's a treasure map mm. uh, in literary form. It doesn't actually have a map, but it's a description of kind of cryptic locations of where there's supposed to be vast amounts of buried treasure. Yes. Uh, it, it, the plot of, a, like I said, an Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that sounds great. Indiana Jones and the Copper Scroll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet that would be a good one. Um, so, what do we know about um, something called the Jerusalem origin theory? What's what's that about? So, the idea is that, um, and there are different variations on this, but one of the claims is that all of these scrolls, or a large number of them, originally came from Jerusalem. Either they were copied there because members of the sect lived in Jerusalem, and then they were brought down here to the compound at Qumran, um, or, and this is a particularly interesting claim, that th the scrolls, or a large number of them, originally formed the library of the temple itself in Jerusalem. And one of the reasons people might propose that is, again, because of the fantastic cost of book production at the time, this is a big library. And consequently, you know, it's on the scale of something like you might expect at the temple. Also, that ties into the Copper Scroll, because the Copper Scroll describes such large amounts of treasure that 
if it's meant to be taken literally, um, you would only expect an institution like the temple to have that much treasure. And so uh, some people have thought that the scrolls uh, originally came from Jerusalem and were brought down here to hide them from the Romans. And so that's uh, the Jerusalem origin theory as opposed to the local Qumran origin theory. So so what do we know about the, the sect that uh, owned or controlled the scrolls uh, as as we know them at the Dead Sea? Yeah, the sect is something that scholars have debated. We know of a number of different parties in Judaism at the time. Uh, two that will be familiar to uh, readers of the New Testament are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, they uh, both were respected groups. The Sadducees were in particular, in particular, were associated with the temple at the time, and the Pharisees were more popular lay religious teachers. They weren't generally priests. And uh, and neither one of them really totally fits with what we read about the sect in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so scholars, for the most part, have looked for another sect that uh, could be the one that wrote them. And the sect that most scholars have settled on <clears throat> are called the Essenes. The Essenes are not mentioned in the New Testament, but they are mentioned as a major Jewish sect by the Jewish historian Josephus and also by the Jewish scholar Philo, both of whom lived in the first century. And according to uh, Josephus and Philo, they were very strict. Uh, they uh, valued celibacy highly, and they lived in the desert. And in fact, we have uh, the Roman uh, naturalist Pliny the, Pliny the Elder talking about the Essenes living in the desert at approximately the location of Qumran. And so from a variety of lines of evidence, most scholars have said that they think that it's the Essenes who are the uh, authors or at least the owners of the Dead Sea Scrolls and then the authors of the specifically sectarian books that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain. And so what do we what do we know about the origin of the Essenes then? Uh, what, what did they believe? Who were they? Uh, what you know, really sets them apart? Uh, well, what what we know from the scrolls, so we, you know, we know various things about the Essenes, like they valued celibacy and they were real strict and they practiced communal property uh, to some degree. Um, and some of that matches with what we see in the scrolls themselves. What we can tell about the sectarians that uh, owned the scrolls is that they seem to date to kind of the mid second century BC. And they had a conflict. So this is the, for readers of the Old Testament, the Catholic Old Testament. This is the time of the Maccabees. And, um, and so you had uh, the Seleucid ruler, uh, pagan ruler, um, Antiochus Epiphanes, who tried to Hellenize the religion of the Jews and get rid of Judaism, basically. He was the one who's like forcing people to eat pork and he's desecrated the temple by setting up an idol of Zeus and sacrificing a pig to it and things like that, which then prompted a Jewish rebellion under the leader of a family of priests who are called today the Maccabees or the Hasmoneans. And, um, and, and, it seems, from what we can tell, that that the resulting reclaiming of the Holy Land and the reestablishment of a Jewish state by the Maccabees played a key role in the origin of the Dead Sea sect. Um, it's it's a little unclear exactly what happened. There are some different theories. One theory that I find very interesting is proposed by uh, Professor. Uh, Rabbi Lawrence Schiffman, uh, who will mention his course in the show notes so people can get that if they want. Um, he points out that er, it looks like what the it looks like the early founders of the Dead Sea sect may have themselves been Sadducees, and they're protesting against non-Sadducean 
legal positions. Remember the halachic letter uh, right. that's protesting against what's happening at the temple. The idea is that when the Maccabees, even though they were a priestly family, when they got in control of the temple, they introduced some new practices that were more like the practices of the Pharisees, and that honked off the uh, purest Sadducees, who then withdrew from fellowship with them into the desert. But things evolved after that, um, and there was apparently a figure that the sect refers to as the teacher of righteousness, um, who they never give his name, but he apparently had like a 20-year experience of spiritual wandering and struggle trying to figure out what God wants before he became the leader of the Dead Sea sect. And then the teacher of righteousness um, basically rose to prominence in the sect and gave it its new uh, kind of more hardened form where they were much more opposed to outsiders. And the teacher of righteousness seems to have been in conflict with someone who is called in the scrolls the wicked priest. And the wicked priest is mysterious uh, they also don't name him. They just use his code name for him. But we have at least a fair idea of who the wicked priest was. Um, it, based on the way he's described, we know he, it, it strongly appears he was the high priest of the time. And uh, the high priests of the Maccabees were also the political leaders of uh, of of the new state of, of Judah. And so consequently, if we look at the time frame and we look at the way the wicked priest is described, it appears that it's Jonathan Maccabee, who is mentioned in obviously the books of Maccabees. Mm -hmm. And he, he reigned from 163, uh, 161 BC to 143 BC. So it looks like that's the time when the teacher of righteousness lived and had his conflict with the wicked priest. Um, they, as we mentioned, we had they had various complaints against the temple. One of the things they complained about was movable feasts. Um, now, Christians are familiar with the fact we have fixed feasts like Christmas that always occur on the same day of the year. Christmas is always December 25th. Mm -hmm. But then there are movable feasts like Easter, which are determined by the uh, by when the spring equinox occur in the phases of the moon. So that floats or moves around the calendar every year. Well, in uh, the temple at this time, they had some movable feasts because uh, what do you do if, let's say, one of the holiest feasts of the year is going to fall on a Monday? And that, or I'm sorry, on a Sunday, and it's right after the Sabbath, and you're not allowed to cook on the Sabbath, and with no refrigeration, it can be hard to make enough food to last you through two days without it spoiling, or considerations like that. You could have one feast stepping on another if they fell on the same day. And so uh, the Jerusalem authorities would move the feast like a day or two on the calendar in a given year to avoid such collisions. And that's a big complaint for the Dead Sea sect. They want the feasts. They had a solar calendar uh, that wasn't based on the phases of the moon. It was like 364 days. So it wouldn't really tie to the, uh, it would get out of phase with the seat with the seasons. And we don't know how they plan to remedy that, but they were adamant. They wanted every feast on the same day of the year, no matter what happened. And so that was one of their big complaints. Um, they also believed that they were living in an apocalyptic age. They expected a great coming war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. They, of course, were the sons of light. And uh, they expected this war to occur with a group they called the Katine, which is their code word for the Romans. And so they were actually, like Jesus, expecting a Roman invasion. Uh, that was going to happen, and they expected this big apocalyptic battle, and they would ultimately win. And one of their documents called the War Scroll actually describes the tactics they plan to use in this war with the Romans, uh, which are actually kind of based on Roman tactics. <laughs> um, but it didn't, obviously, that didn't end up working out for them. They were very concerned about ritual purity, uh, which was, you know, a big it has always been a big issue in uh, Jewish theology. 
for them, like one of their debates over ritual purity was suppose you've got a clean vessel of a liquid and you're pouring the clean liquid into another vessel and then you discover that the lower vessel you're pouring it into is unclean. What what happens with respect to the uncleanness? Well, the Pharisees would say, this isn't a problem. Whatever liquid goes into the unclean vessel becomes unclean, but the upper vessel is okay. It's still clean. Well, not for the Dead Sea sect. What they said is that the uncleanness travels up the liquid that's being poured and contaminates the upper vessel. So if you pour from a clean vessel into an unclean one, then both vessels become unclean with all of the liquid, and you've got to throw all of it out. Um, so that's one of their legal disputes. Uh, also, we know that they had a somewhat broader canon of Scripture than the Pharisees did. The Pharisees uh, accepted basically the proto-canonical books of the Old Testament. There was still some debate for a few centuries about a few of them, but it was basically the proto-canonical books. Um, the Essenes accepted those, plus um, they accepted First Enoch and Jubilees as scripture, and they, se they seem to have accepted a work called the Temple Scroll, which is kind of an additional book of the Pentateuch that describes the way the temple should work. And they also regarded that as scripture from what we can tell. So it it sounds like, once again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, we're still having yeah. similar debates and similar complaints. It's very interesting to see how human nature doesn't really change. So, yeah. uh, so, so that's a good summary of, of, you know, who the people are behind the scrolls. Um, now that I've heard that, you know, teacher of righteousness and some of this language has led some people to believe that the uh, authors of the scrolls or the holders of the scrolls were themselves proto-Christians. Um, yeah. That, that that John the Baptist or even maybe Jesus were themselves, uh, you know, uh, uh, members of this sect. It's not impossible that, uh, that they may have had some contact with the Dead Sea sect. Uh, John the Baptist, you know, is known to have spent a lot of time in the desert. Uh, growing up, he may have encountered members of the sect. There are some points of similarity between Christianity and the Dead Sea sect. One of them is, uh, like us, they valued celibacy, although they didn't mandate it for everybody. Um, they also have some terms for their leaders that kind of correspond to Christian terms. They had people who were called overseers, or in Greek, episkopoi, or in English, bishops. Um, so it's, it's essentially the same term, depending on what language you want to use to describe it. But they had some similar terms for officers. Um, ultimately, though, it's, it, it's not possible to identify the Dead Sea sect with early Christians for a couple of reasons, uh, really for several reasons. But one of them is that the scrolls are just too early. Um, Jesus didn't begin his ministry until around AD 29, and by that point, the vast majority of scrolls were already written. Um, and, and so there's just not enough overlap in time frame. Also, the, uh, the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls are really anti-Gentile. They, they, they do not look favorably upon Gentiles who are the sons of darkness and and that's totally different than the attitude of Jesus and his followers, who were much more open to Gentiles. I mean, Jesus himself went and preached in Gentile territory. That If you look at the feeding of the 4,000 in the Gospel of Mark, if you track the geography of where Jesus is carefully, he's actually preaching to Gentiles and has 4,000 of them in the desert for three days until they run out of food. That's how interested these people are in Jesus. Uh, the Gadarene demoniac is another one where Jesus goes out of his way to help a Gentile. Um, so that's, and kind of correlate to that, the Christians have a very different attitude 
towards ritual purity. Jesus is on record saying, nothing that enters your mouth makes you unclean. It's just going to pass out of the body. It's what comes out of your heart that makes you unclean. And so this completely different attitude towards ritual purity and Sabbath observance and things like that is all utterly different and would have been utterly rejected by the Dead Sea sect. So really, because of timing considerations and theological differences, we know that the Dead Sea sect, even though they had some common ideas with Christians, they're not the same group. And so the other two major possibilities are either the Sadducees or the Essenes? Yeah. Now, the Sadducees are interesting. It, it it would be very unlikely that the Dead Sea sect would have simply been the Sadducees because we know they believed things Sadducees didn't. One of the things the ancient sources tell us is that Sadducees did not believe in angels and they did not believe in an afterlife. They thought when you died, that's it, you're worm food. But we know the Dead Sea sect did believe in an afterlife and a coming resurrection and things like that. And so um, so they couldn't simply be the Sadducees. But Lawrence Schiffman's proposal is that the early leaders were Sadducees, and then they split with the Sadducees, and then the Dead Sea sect began to incorporate more lay leaders who would have introduced more popular lay ideas, like among the Pharisees, like belief in an afterlife and stuff like that. And so they may have a link to the Sadducees, but they're not the same group. Okay. <clears throat> and, then, and, that would, and then that leads to why most scholars would say they're the Essenes. Right. And even, even Schiffman is willing to say that you, you could call them Essenes in a kind of a broad sense, though he thinks there was more than one group of Essenes and they had differences among the different groups. Right. Yeah. I, it, things are always a little more complex than we tend to think they are, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that that makes sense. So that's that's the background of of the Dead Sea Scrolls then. Uh, so this leads us to then, you know, considering the claims uh, from our faith and reason perspectives. So let's let's approach it from the reason perspective, these various claims about about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, what what does reason tell us about based on this history? Well, it tells us that this is a fascinating archaeological find, and it sheds a lot of light on Second Temple era Judaism. That's the period um, where, after Solomon's temple had been destroyed, a new temple got rebuilt, which was then expanded and augmented by Herod the Great. That whole period, up to its destruction in 70, is called the Second Temple era. And these scrolls are a great witness to what was going on in Judaism at that time, uh, because it, it shows us both what the sectarians believed and because they attack their opponents in these documents, it gives us more information about what other Jews believed too. So the, the, the one of the other claims is that these were suppressed by the Vatican or somebody else, usually because they contain something that undermines fundamental aspects of Christian faith. Um, uh, and and it's it's true that the public weren't able to get access to most of them for for decades. So right. what's what's the what's going on here? What what happened? Well, it's true that that only a few of the scrolls were published initially by scholars, and then there was this huge horde of them that was not published, and that's what people were claiming the Vatican was suppressing. Well, the Vatican was never in control of the scrolls, so it couldn't suppress them, although some of the scholars working on the scrolls were Catholics. Um, what really happened is, I'm trying to think of a polite way to put it, it was basically a colossal scholarly snafu. <laughs> uh, you had these scholars, some of whom had personal problems. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, for example, later turned out to be bipolar. And so he, for example, would go through these depressive phases where he wasn't getting a lot of work done. And basically, the scholars who were on the initial scroll committee, um, who, or I should say who were on the scroll committee, got bogged down. They were, they were doing a lot of work on other stuff. They came very, became territorial about the scrolls. They didn't publish them in an ex in an expedited manner. 
And they basically let them languish, as scholarly projects sometimes can languish for a long time. Um, eventually, the logjam was broken in 1991. And, it, and this is another part that we could do as if we do a story of the Dead Sea Scrolls episode. This is a really fascinating um, part of that. It turns out that even though the scrolls as a whole had not been published, they had been indexed in the form of a concordance. A concordance is a book where you can, like most people are familiar with biblical concordances, where you'll have every word in the Bible, if it's a complete concordance, um, with a verse reference and a little bit of text on each side. So if you want to say, look up every occurrence of the word apple in the Bible, you turn to A, here's a list of all the references to the word apple with a little snippet of text on each side, and then a verse citation of, in the margin, so you know where to look for it in the Bible. Well, they, scholars had published a complete concordance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so in 1991, um, some computer, computer guys said, let's reconstruct them from the concordance. Because so, computers were just getting to powerful enough to do such things. To, do, to do this, yeah. yeah. So they fed the concordance data into a computer program that could then say, okay, this is from this scroll, and it's got these words on both sides of, of this term. Let's look for another piece that has those words and stitch them all together. And so they had a computer reconstruction of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which they then published and, you know, leaked without permission. <laughs> and then it turned out that um, there were a couple of institutions that for archival purposes, you know, in case anything ever happened to the original scrolls, they had uh, photos of them. And they and and uh, one of them was here in California. And they said, oh, well, now that the text is out there in the computer reconstructed version, it's not secret anymore, so we can publish all these photographs we've got. And so the logjam was finally broken in 1991, and these days all of the Dead Sea Scrolls are available. Uh, in fact, I mean, I've got copies of all of them sitting on my home computer in digital form that I can search through in my Logos Bible software. Um, they're available in many editions. I also have books of them, too, you know, in, in physical dead tree form. Um, and if you want, you can go. There's, they're all available online for free at a website in Israel. You can go and uh, and and read them, uh, browse them, read articles about them for yourself. Uh, we'll have a link to that site. It's called the Dead Sea Scrolls Digital Archive, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And so none of them is hidden anymore, and we know what all of them say. Scholars are still evaluating them, but one thing's become really clear is there there are no startling revelations about Christianity in them, nothing to shake the faith. And so the whole uh, Vatican suppression idea was just wrong. It was really just a big scholarly snafu. And so, like you said, there's nothing about Christians in it because they weren't written by Christians, and the the, the vast majority of them were written long before anyone in Qumran had ever probably heard of Christians. Right. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't fringe people who will say otherwise. For example, um, there was a, an Australian woman named Barbara Thiering who had this crazy um, theory. Most of the crazy theories about the Dead Sea Scrolls, as, as Schiffman points out, are basically one scholar theories where you have one person who's off on a tear. They think they've discovered what everybody else has missed. And Barbara Thiering was an example of that. Uh, she claimed that based on her reinterpretation of the scrolls, which she said was done according to the Jewish Pesher method, um, that it turns out they really are about key figures in the New Testament, like Jesus and James the Just and people like that. But she was crazy. <laughs> um, and her, her use of, I mean, she's using an actual Hebrew word, Pesher, that refers to interpretation, but her Pesher method is nothing like how the actual Pesher method works. And scholars have, have widely heaped scorn on that. Um, so you will find people who make these claims, 
but they're 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 really off on their own. The carbon fourteen dating alone precludes those series. Okay. Yes, the, they're all much older, and and yeah. us. There's no. There's nothing. There's nothing from the New Testament in there either. There's nothing, or even analogous to the New Testament, like the Lost Gospels and that sort of stuff. Right. There are a few, and these again are one one scholar theories. There have been a few scholars who have tried to propose that little scraps of uh, of Christian writings are there. Uh, most famously, one scholar claimed that there is a tiny little snippet of Mark that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And personally, I would love that because that would prove that Mark was written before AD 70, which I happen to agree with. I think Mark was written in the AD 50s. So it would have been possible that they could have had a copy of Mark around for some reason. Maybe they were planning to write a refutation of these new Christian claims. Um, but, uh, but so even though I would love that to be the case, the problem is the, the fragment is so tiny. It has like one word and parts of a couple of other words on it. And, and it could really be from anything. <laughs> right. Um, and so, uh, most scholars have looked at these tiny snippets that are claimed to have been Christian and it's just this could be anything guys there's no proof this is the new testament so um is is there any do they suspect that there are any other caves to be found out there well we recently found another one which is now known as cave 12 and we know that uh it did contain uh jars like the pottery jars the scrolls were in it also contained uh parchment um, with like the material the scrolls were written on, and it contains certain binding things they used to kind of strap the scrolls together, um, kind of the ancient equivalent of like rolling a, a rubber band around your newspaper. Um, so it, we're real sure that this cave, which is now known as Cave 12, did at one time hold the de some Dead Sea Scrolls, but they're gone. And so it looks like the Bedouin took them out of this cave and didn't accurately report where they got them. They probably did, though, sell them on the antiquities market. So we should have the scrolls that were in that cave. We just didn't. We we just don't accurately know which cave they came from. Okay. It's also possible that there are other caves out there that we haven't yet found um, that also contain scrolls from this sect. Uh, we know there are caves that contain other interesting scrolls and documents uh, from approximately this time period during the second great Jewish rebellion in the AD 130s, which was led by a guy named Simon Bar Kokhba. Um, we've actually found letters in a cave in this area that he wrote. Hmm. And so, um, so there's, there's lots of interesting stuff that has been found and there's probably stuff that hasn't yet been found. Okay. So that's the the reason perspective on the claims. What is what about the faith perspective? How do we approach this from from our uh, our Catholic faith uh, against these claims about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, one of the things uh, that's interesting from a faith perspective is they provide really startling confirmation of the accuracy of the Old Testament texts. Prior to the, the discovery of these scrolls, the earliest manuscripts that we had of, say, Isaiah or the Psalms were written um, in the Christian age, and many of them much later, and especially if you're looking at the Hebrew ones, because Christians generally wrote in Greek or Latin or something. The earliest Hebrew manuscripts we had were written by Jews in basically the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And then when we found these scrolls, and because of that, it was possible for liberal scholars to say, oh, well, they're all inaccurate. We have no idea what the original said. They've been copied so many times. There could have been all kinds of errors introduced, despite the fact that the copyists in Judaism, the Masoretes, had elaborate procedures to guard against transcription errors. Um, but then with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, suddenly we've leapfrogged back a thousand years to the period when some of the biblical writings were actually being written. And it showed overwhelmingly that what we had in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament was accurate. And there are some variations here and there, um, but, uh, but by and large, uh, 
they were extraordinarily accurate and preserved in a in a very pristine way over many, many centuries. And the few things where there are differences is great too, because now we have another resource that we that scholars can use to try to determine the original reading. So uh, what I've heard is, is that we have the most complete text. The most complete one is the text of Isaiah. Um, and in yeah. fact, you can go to a museum in, in Israel right now and where they have the scroll all laid out, you can, it's in a circle, and you can walk around it and look at this text of Isaiah that's a thousand years older than any previous one and predates the time of Christ. Right. I think that's the shrine of the book in the shrine, Jerusalem. Right, right, right. The shrine of the mm-hmm. book, which uh, is in the shape of a scroll jar, which is kind of unique. Um, yeah. So that's that's really neat. Um, so. What you mentioned that the, that they can help scholars figure out what the Old Testament original text said. What, what's up? So I don't want to get too much into biblical translation, but right. how does that help them a little? Like just a little bit, if you could uh, explain some of that. Well, for example, um, there are minor variations because at this time everything was hand copied, and so scribes will make errors. They may accidentally skip a line, you know, if they lose their place or something like that. And um, they may misspell a word and accidentally change it into another word. You know, like if you if you wrote Pat instead of cat in English. Just early autocorrect. Letter. Yeah, <laughs> early autocorrect. Yeah. Um, so uh, so those kind of things happen. And we have the Hebrew text in, you know, that the Masoretes produced in the Middle Ages. But then we also had uh, the Greek translation, for example, of the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament made in about the same time period as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, um, sometimes the Septuagint will have, in in a given verse, it'll have a slightly different reading than what's in the Masoretic text. And now that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can look at them and say, well, what does what did they say? Do they support the Masoretic reading? Do they support the Septuagint reading? Or is it something else? And so it gives us a new data stream that scholars can use to try to weigh these different options and thus increases our understanding of the details of the text. So some of the more modern translations that have been made since the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, might be uh, accurate is probably not the right word, but but ba- but will be they, based on that. Yeah, they'll incorporate information from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and if you look in most Bibles uh, in the footnotes, you'll see little notes in the Old Testament like this is what the Hebrew says, but this is what the Septuagint says, and it'll usually abbreviate that as LXX, which is the Latin number 70, uh, Septuaginta. And then it'll also note the DSS, the Dead Sea Scrolls, say this. Okay. All right. So um, so it helps us. Um, let me just kind of uh, think about what else the faith perspective tells us. Um, well, it, it, it helps us understand early Judaism, right? I mean, that's that's one of the big things that it does. It does, but it also helps us understand the matrix that Christianity formed in. Uh, one of the things that liberal scholars had had done uh, was say, well, uh, these points on which Christians differed from Jews or the Jews we know about just show like pagan influence like celibacy. Jews were not celibate. There were no celibate Jews. Um, This Christian thing has been influenced by some pagan source. Well, no. Um, And even before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we knew about the Essenes. It's just not as much attention was paid to them. And they did value celibacy. Um, So we see that a lot of the ideas that we find in the New Testament that weren't part of the Pharisee tradition or the Sadducee tradition are part of the Essene tradition. So we know these ideas were in common circulation. A favorite example of mine in that regard is um, is something called the Messianic Apocalypse. When I was at the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit, they had this little paddle-like device you'd hold up to your ear and punch in a number as you walked around to different exhibits, and it would play a little bit of audio for you. And I'm looking at this one scroll, listening to it, and it's quoting from a, from a Dead Sea document, 
called the Messianic Apocalypse. And I immediately recognized what it was saying as a reference to the same idea that's in Luke 7, verses 21 to 22. In that passage, Jesus is responding to the messengers of John the Baptist, that John the Baptist is sent to inquire, are you the Messiah or should we look for someone else? And Jesus says, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. Okay, so that's what it says in Luke. Well, even though that's based on a passage in Isaiah, it's even more closely copied in terms of sequence and stuff in the Messianic Apocalypse, which talks about the coming of a Messiah. And so it would make all the sense in the world if it was commonly understood that the Messiah was going to come and do these things, that Jesus would cite this back to the messengers of John the Baptist. So it shows that the that the ideas Jesus used to show that he was the Messiah are ones that were already commonly circulating in Israel about these are things the Messiah is going to do. And the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, reveal that to us, and <clears throat> the Messianic Apocalypse in particular dates from 150 years earlier. So they had been in circulation as part of the Jewish Messianic expectation for 150 years by the time Jesus fulfilled them. Wow. So um, we've talked about the faith perspective, the reason perspective. What's the bottom line on the on these claims about the mystery of the Dead Sea Scrolls? The bottom line is that they're a fascinating archaeological find that sheds light on Second Temple era Judaism and on early Christianity. Uh, they strengthen the reliability of both the Old Testament text and New Testament theology, but they don't contain any earth-shaking or faith-shaking revelations. Great. That was a, a great in-depth <laughs> look at the mm -hmm. Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I mean, again, as you can tell, we could probably talk about this for ages more. But we're going to yeah. have some links to resources if you're interested to to, to do some more research. Uh, we'll have that in the show notes uh, uh, on our website or, or wherever you are looking at this or listening to this uh, podcast now. It might, might, might be there in the links below. Um, Jimmy, you've mentioned that there's a great courses course by uh, Old Testament. Gary school. Rensberg. Gary yeah. Rensberg. And there's a modern scholar course by uh, Lawrence Schiffman. Both of them are highly recommendable. Okay. Uh, and those are available through Amazon, uh, as are uh, uh, the book, The Dead Sea Scrolls Today by James Vanderkam. Mm -hmm. Also a good uh, resource. And then we'll also have a link to the Dead Sea Scrolls digital library online, where you can view all of the scrolls yourself, as well as a Wikipedia article about them. Great. Excellent. So uh, we have a few minutes left. I want to go right to our uh, mysterious feedback. <laughs> Uh, we have been getting some great feedback from folks, lots of feedback. We love hearing from you. Um, so the first feedback is from Steve Smith on Facebook. And he said, he asked, um, I'm curious what your thoughts are about those people who have had firsthand up close interaction with Bigfoot. Uh, people have been really excited to talk about Bigfoot. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, that, just, I, I, lo I love having this back and forth. Such as people that may have been attacked by them, not just by getting rocks thrown at them, but actual physical contact. Uh, Steve says, I've heard of a few cases like that. What are your yeah. thoughts, Jimmy? Well, I've heard of that too. And I think he's I think he's right that uh it's if you've had up close contact rather than just rocks or stuff being thrown at you, that's more dispositive. It it tends to prove the Bigfoot thesis better. Um, because even though like some people have said, well, all the Bigfoot sightings are bears. Well, bears don't throw rocks, <laughs> but humans hoaxing you do throw rocks. And so if you don't see it, if you don't have an up-close encounter, then it, 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 there remains this element of speculation. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to make of uh, claimed up-close encounters. Obviously, some people are hoaxers and would make up such things. Um, but I can't rule out that some of them are not hoaxes. I would love... Uh, for there to uh, be actual physical proof of the existence of, of, of Bigfoot. Um, thus far, though, it remains on the level of, of, of 
just what people have claimed. And that's not enough to show that a species exists, just having claimed it. We need DNA or we need a body or we need bones or something like that to really prove that it exists. And, and it would be great if one day we get proof, although in my view, at least, the odds of a, of a large primate remaining undiscovered in North America when this many people have been looking for it for this long is on the lower order. So uh, another piece of feedback, this time from Kevin uh, A.M. Cannell. I am hope I'm pronouncing that right. I think this was from Facebook, too. Uh, and he says, uh, hello, I've loved your show so far, and I'm very glad to be listening. I was wondering if there's any possibility for a follow-up to some of these discussions, although it sounds like with episode five, that was Lost Gospels episode, uh, you did do that a little. As with episode three and transhumanism, I think it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on the video game Deus Ex. Uh, it also goes into Area 51 somewhat, but I don't really know how you'd incorporate Deus Ex into the show either, as it would probably be a quick thing, not much to discuss. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, Ed, you familiar with the game, Jimmy? I've heard of it, but I'm. This is one area of my uh, of my cultural knowledge that is really lacking. <laughs> I I was a role playing gamer yeah. back in the day, but I don't really do video computer games, uh, so I'm not familiar with it. But I am pleased to say, Kevin, that uh, we are incorporating mysterious feedback now as a regular segment in the show. So right. we do like the back and forth. Uh, I do have experience with the game, by the way, Deus Ex, many years ago. Uh, an early version of it, one of the first installments of it. Um, and it's the sort of thing where the, the main character gets um, jacked in with various improvements, you know, mechanical and computerized improvements. So um, it's been so long. I'm not sure I could, I could speak to it uh, with regard to transhumanism. Although um, a police officer or a secret agent who can uh, uh, supplement his abilities by uh, uploading or connecting various devices. Um, that's uh that's, that's an interesting thought. Anyway, uh, so uh, that's our that's our feedback for this week. And if, again, if you want to send us feedback, you can do that uh, by going to our Facebook page, leaving comment there, or uh, leaving comments on YouTube, Twitter, on our website at sqpn.com. Um, or you can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Those are all great ways to send us some feedback. And then to finish up, uh, we have some mysterious headlines. Yeah, so one of them, since I knew we'd be talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, I included uh, in the mysterious headlines, which you can get in the show notes with links to the original stories, um, a story about Cave 12, the newly discovered Dead Sea Scroll cave. You can see pictures of some of the stuff that was found in it and read uh, read more about all that stuff and the significance of the cave. Uh, we recently did an episode of transhumanism, and I try to let voices you know, uh, speak uh, to these uh, from somewhat different perspectives. And so I included a link to an article in a French news service called, Is Transhumanism a Sham? And what's interesting about this article, and we touched on this briefly in the show, but what's interesting in this article is that it questions the possibility of achieving some of the goals that transhumanists want to achieve. You know, can you really upgrade human nature without causing unacceptable uh, problems that offset them. You know, it's kind of like uh, some people have said, well, people who are very intelligent, so their brains are wired for intelligence, it also introduces other neurological problems. And there's, so there's a cost-benefit analysis. And so that's one of the things this article questions. Hmm. Uh, finally, Beauty and the Beast may have a historical basis. Mm. Uh, there was a guy named Petrus Gonsalves, who was a native of the Canary Islands uh, back in the 1500s, but he got taken to France. And what was interesting about him, or one of the things that was interesting about him, is he suffered from hypertrichosis, or werewolf syndrome, where you have hair growing all over you, including every bit of your face. And at the uh, at the the court in France, he married a lady of the court, and she was a you know she's the beauty, he's the beast, <laughs> and then the story uh, may have uh, been related to this uh, to this individual. So if you want to read about the possible historical basis of Beauty and the Beast, uh, check out uh, our show notes where we'll have a link to the story. Excellent. 
And once again, I want to remind folks, please, uh, to like, comment, subscribe, uh, hit the bell for notifications on YouTube, and share the show with folks. Uh, you, you're you're our lifeline to getting the, the, the news out about uh, Mysterious World and these very interesting discussions. So that's it from us. Uh, so I, we do want to hear from you. What do you think about what we had to say about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the claims and counterclaims and, and the various aspects? Um, so, like, like I said, you can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Visit us at sqpn.com and leave a comment on the, uh, the uh, episode there. Or at the either the SQPN Facebook page, and there's now a, a Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page just for the show, uh, so you can look for either of those. And uh, you can also go to the the show notes in, on SQPN.com, find links to our personal social media and websites, as well as the other links we talked about here. So until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World.